thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Uh, it's a sunny evening in, uh, sunny Thursday evening in July, so naturally, where else would you be? Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for caring. Uh, my name is Paul Constant. Uh, I am the moderator of the panel. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank Fuse Washington and my employer, Civic Ventures, uh, for co-hosting this. And I want to thank Town Hall for uh, giving us this space tonight. Uh, it's such a wonderful space. I really, every time I walk into the new Town Hall, I just fall in love all over again. Uh, and they're, they're, the downstairs especially, this used to look like a church basement, which had its charms, but uh, this is really something. Uh, it's just very impressive. Um, so thank you to them. Uh, so yeah, uh, just to give you a little bit of context on where I'm coming from, I uh, was the books editor at The Stranger uh, from 2008 to 2000, early, early 2015. Uh, I also covered the 2012 presidential election. Uh, I left The Stranger in 2015. Uh, maybe we'll get into why a little later. Uh, and um, then uh, I went to work at Civic Ventures, uh, where I do political messaging. I also, in my spare time, uh, co-founded a website called the Seattle Review of Books, which is a book review, news, and interview site. Uh, so uh, that is something. So I'm coming to this as a former reporter and also somebody who runs a, runs a media site. Um, you will have plenty of opportunity to ask questions. We have, micro we have two microphones, one on either side. I'll let you know when it's time to line up and, uh, and, and to ask your questions, uh, and I promise you'll, you'll have plenty of time. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let's get to the panel. Uh, on the far end here, we have Adrian Russell. She's the uh, Mary Laird Wood Professor in the Department of Communication. That's right. Department of Communication and Associate Director of the Center for Communication and Civic Engagement at University of Washington. Her research explores journalism and activist communication and how they shape coverage of various pressing social issues, including climate change, corporate and government surveillance, and tech policy. She's written two books on journalism, Networked, A Contemporary History of News and Transition, and Journalism as Activism, Recoding Media Power. In the center, we have uh, Clifford Cliff Cawthon, a professor of political science, that's right. Well, yeah. Just yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's not Clifford Cliff. No, yeah. No, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's a professor of political science and culture and cultural and ethnic studies at Bellevue College and a local freelance journalist. He's reported on housing, racial justice, and local politics. In addition to his work as a journalist, he's also been a workers' rights and community organizer, working on historic campaigns such as the Fight for 15. Currently, he's living and thriving in South Seattle. Uh, and. To my immediate left here, we have Peter Jackson. Man, you step on my lines with applause, and then I give you a good, good space, and you just, you just miss it. Uh, Peter Jackson is a freelance journalist. He's the former editorial page director of the Everett, Her Everett Herald. Uh, he also worked at CrossCut.com shortly after its inception, writing The Daily Scan, a compendium of local news, as well as original stories on local, state, and national politics. Uh, during his Everett service, uh, Peter wrote a series of editorials questioning the wisdom of Pacific Northwest coal export facilities, which received the Dolly Connolly Award for Excellence in Environmental Reporting. He also experienced and survived the Herald's ownership transition from the Washington Post to British Columbia-based Sound Publishing. He's a graduate of Georgetown University, a former Vista volunteer, and a co-founder of the University of Washington Center for Human Rights. He and his wife, Lori Werner, live in Seattle. So. Uh, First, I guess I wanted to ask each of you uh, about your personal experience with the decline of traditional media and journalism, either as a, as a consumer or an expert or a participant. Uh, and we'll start with you. Yeah, sorry, this is being recorded uh, for several different outlets, so... Uh, okay. so. Uh, so I would say that my experience with the decline of journalism or the transition that has gone through uh, sort of mirrors my, my experience as an academic. I got my PhD in the late 90s in a journalism school that thought the internet was a trend. It was a, you know, they, they were sure it was going to pass and it was sort of, uh, my topic was the, 
the influence of the internet on journalism, and they thought that it was probably not a great career move for me, but it ended up being a good career move for me because it was such a significant influencer in what happened in not just American journalism, but journalism all over the world. So I have been um, from, uh, you know, for many years tracing and researching and thinking about these issues. And so I've lived a bunch of different places over these past 15 years, 20 years. Um, and I've been had a chance to see up close what, you know, what these impacts are on journalists, on civic life, on activists, and on issues that are of importance to publics. So, thanks. Uh, thank you. And first of all, thank you uh, for coming out tonight. And all of you are beautiful. This is fantastic. Give yourselves a round of applause. Go ahead, brag on yourself. Super. Yeah, and for my friends from the 37th Legislative District, little shout out for you, woot woot. Anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> So um, anyway, to question, uh, like I tell my students at uh, BC, I am a child of the internet. Uh, so most of my, most of my, um, most of my um, organizing career actually uh, has happened in tandem and has taken up majority of my professional life, um, really, uh, for my entire adult life. So um, in terms of the decline of print media, I've been in the middle of that transition and really adapting to the new landscape. And in fact, we were talking a little bit about this uh, in the green room, but my experience of it is the is basically instead of the idealized uh, kind of digital landscape that we have uh, that we are given the outset of the internet and the rise of digital media that I've seen increasingly become an uneven battle battlefield based upon the commodification of digital media meaning instead of creating content to critically engage challenge and to invite people to engage with each other it's more in some of this is cliche, but it's more become a battleground for, or rather a platform for reactionaries to uh, be able to spew their bile. And it has become an uneven, and I would say even a treacherous uh, battleground for um, whether it is critical, uh, critical journalism to be able to fight against the current of reactionaries. And also, um, on the one hand, a, a really great platform for grassroots, grassroots journalism. So essentially the new media landscape and the decline of print media and the rise of digital media is a double-edged sword. Because on the one hand, you have blogs like Black Girl Dangerous and you have uh, websites like Color Lines, you have Crosscut, you have all these great uh, things coming out. Yet, on the other hand, you have just as many platforms for things like uh, local TV stations that will remain nameless, uh, you have Infowars, so on and so forth, right? So, in just to kind of put a pin on my answer, that I think that we're in a very interesting time that requires that if we have an interactive media, it requires us now more than ever to approach it just like civic engagement, that we can no longer be spectators. We have to be participants to some degree. I look forward to exploring this. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, you know, I, I kind of want to take the positive view on this, that it's media is transforming, whatever the cliches might be. Um, it's it's going through a pretty bad phase, obviously, right now. And I, starting in high school, I, I worked at a place called the Enumclaw Courier, Courier Herald, which was a, a weekly that was very important to the people in Enumclaw at the time. And uh, and since that time, and in my varied positions, I have a kind of a eclectic, which is also code for probably um, uh, bo uh, bohemian or non-traditional route um, uh, in my own sort of uh, approach to media and my own career. Um, the, the importance of local news, I mean, that was a touchstone and everyone would, everyone would read the Enumclaw Career Herald in, the, in that area. And uh, I, my greatest concern, whether we call it a transformation, whether we call it disruption, whether we call it the decline of, of media, is, is losing that um, because I think, as most people agree, I mean, the New York Times and the Washington Post and a few others are gonna continue on. Um, and there's 
there is hope in that in that respect. But um, you see it in places like Everett, and I see my old boss Neil Pattison in the back, so I can't say anything um, untoward. Um, uh, uh, but I, I was there. I was uh, at the brief time that I was editorial page editor. Uh, you know, I witnessed the transition from the Washington Post, which was which actually owned the Everett Herald, um, and uh, it was the only daily paper that the Graham family owned, other than the Washington Post. Ironically, uh, Catherine Graham decided that that papers grow north, and so she, in 1977, uh, she and her family bought the the Everett Herald. And then it was it was sold to Sound Publishing, which is uh, a, a little bit more of a troubling enterprise for various reasons, including not being um, particularly worker friendly, and um, it, it, it it was difficult to witness that. And part of it too is is what kind of community spirit it has or civic spirit. Um, and uh, and so my hope, and I think the hope of a lot of people at the Herald and a lot of good writers and and journalists and and all of you who care about an issue like this. Um, that the hope is that with the transition to digital media that we're going to still have a local audience and maybe that is another thing and another topic that we can talk about at some point is what's going to happen in terms of questions of equity I mean do low income people are they even going to uh, be able to subscribe to the online version of some of these outlets um, and I worry about kind of the common conversation um, so yes Transforming, but hope. There's hope. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure. Um, so you know, um, when so Paul, when you were talking about, um, you know, when you were talking about your experience, it jogged my memory, and it reminded me of the first time I actually had some modicum of power in a uh, media outlet. So I was the, I was effectively the editor in chief of Buffalo Indie Media when I was uh, younger, and this was goodness. I'm both going to date myself. I'm probably botched to date, but whatever. Um, so, right. so on, uh, it was I want to say it was 2010, and one of the and one of the interesting things about this was it was my first it was my first time in this position of power. So I'd start thinking about um, not just ethical journalism standards, but also what kind of media source, what kind of media outlet we want it to be. And in this evolution of the media, we also have to start defining and creating a new typology when it comes to media. In fact, Adrian, just to shine a spotlight on someone we were talking about in the green room, if I can, um, in, one thing you highlighted was the advocacy or the nature of advocacy media. And I remember, you know, doing a bit of research in my postgraduate at the University of Manchester and during my undergraduate at Buffalo State, shout out for SUNY, <laughs> um, say University of New York, um, about the rise of advocacy media. And for me, I think that when, that we don't, really have a common language and we are just starting to create that uh, type of that type of consciousness around types of media because these and I talk to my students about this a lot because these days there's advocacy media there's edutainment and that what one could consider objective reportage or um, objective local reportage or if there ever was such a thing as objective reportage because of course we as we know that there's a history of racial and class bias in terms of um, press coverage right which you know we can talk more about but all you know that kind of very who what where when why of reportage is being supplanted by edutainment is um, unfortunately conflated with um, advocacy uh, advocacy reporting that needs to happen. But more importantly, you know the really critical and great reporting where we will call something what it is. So you know we will call a crisis a crisis or we will you know a lot of that is being curved and a lot and you know i experienced this when i was doing uh freelance work you know for the emeralds back in the day when i was much younger with indie media and you know even today i have to think twice when i do freelance articles essentially what is the, we have to curb that uh critical uh if you will that critical calling out of um of 
objective crises or um, really reactionary and regressive behavior because of backlash and because we don't have that consciousness around the type of media that exists today or these different types of media as time goes on and as we evolve, as it evolves. Okay. Everybody here has said something that uh, I could spend 90 minutes on, so uh, I'll be trying to swoop back to, to address those issues. Uh, uh, Adrian, I guess I, I wanted to ask you, uh, we know that this is a national problem, uh, maybe even a global problem. I'm not so sure about that part, but uh, is, is Seattle's media landscape unique? Uh, are, we, are we suffering a deterioration of media at, at at a faster rate or a slower rate, or uh, do you even uh, suspect my premise of uh, deterioration as, as a real issue? Well, I'm not sure exactly the, you know, how the numbers compare. Like, mm -hmm. So I can't say deterioration in terms of, for example, the number of reporters who have lost their jobs or, um, you know, the number of uh, dollars that have left, you know, the... Seattle Times, for example, in the last several years, or the journalism industry in general. But I can cite my colleague, Matt Powers, who's here today, work, um, who's done a lot of uh, research on the specific instance of Seattle, and especially compared to uh, Toulouse, France, uh, which is a, a city of similar size that has experienced similar decline in journalism. And I think uh, what one of the interesting things that he's found is that what's unique about Seattle is that there has been a huge influx of startup money for startup ventures because of the need, the clear decline of traditional journalism, and that has bred a lot of innovation. Um, and so in that sense, I'm not sure if it's the only place where you can see that that dynamic. Certainly there's other cities that are, um, you know, experimenting with really interesting online platforms. Um, but the number um, and the sort of innovation that's happening here, I think, is unique. Um, but with that said, uh, funders tend to like to fund new things. And so it's very difficult to sustain these innovative platforms, even when they are successful, because uh, if you can only get a grant for a startup or a new idea, um, then eventually you can't sustain yourself. Um, so in that sense, I think it's unique. In some senses, I think it's, you know, mirrors what's happening in, at, at the national level for sure. On the one hand, there's a, you know, absolute bottoming out of the business model. On the other hand, there's all of this innovation. And I think maybe 10 years ago, most people were much more optimistic about it. And now we're seeing you know, what happens if you don't have traditional institutions, news institutions in place, like the manipulation and the um, sort of darker side of the free-for-all that the internet is. Uh, Peter, you were at Crosscut at the beginning. Um, and that that's one of the, to my mind, that's one of the few uh, really bright spots in terms of, of growth that they've they've delivered. Uh, I guess full disclosure, Crosscut was founded by David Brewster, who founded Town Hall, uh, for whatever that's worth. I uh, also founded Seattle Weekly. So uh, I think he, what does he call himself in his bio now? A serial, a serial founder, I think is what he calls himself. So uh, can you can you talk a little bit about, about what was it like uh, being there at the beginning trying to establish a new, a new media organization? Because uh, what Adrian was saying about, about that, that level of trust is important, and you can't sort of manifest that out of thin air. Yeah, I, I think a lot of, uh, because of the trust and respect and the kind of gravitas that, that David brought to it, no, it was exciting. And it was about 10 years ago. It's interesting. There was optimism 10 years ago. Uh, and. And things like, for example, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go. I, I don't want to go off subject, but there's something. Kaiser Health News is a good example. They started around the same time, and because that's why I have my man purse of chemo, uh, I you don't know where to go for health news, so you go to Kaiser Health News, which is outstanding, but it's still Kaiser, and so it's interesting that you know you, you do have these agendas at times before. Uh, it, it, it certainly gives you a frame of reference. But I think things were optimistic. I think a lot of it hinged on David's reputation um, as a serial innovator. It also were it also revolved a lot of very around a lot of very generous donors, including people like Tom Alberg and uh, Jerry Grinstein and others who 
believed in in David. And so, you know, it was a for-profit model at the outset. And he quickly ran into, and the team there really ran into uh, problems uh, within, I think, the first couple of years. And then there was the switch to the nonprofit model, which worked for a while. And now they're on, I mean, now they're one of the biggest newsrooms in the Seattle area. And that's largely, I want to say, not only because of the hard work over time, but because they partnered with KCTS, right? And so that has been a huge, I think that was a lifesaver for, for CrossCut. So no, it was exciting. It was, it was kind of like, yeah, you, you felt like you're president at the creation. And I was almost ancillary to a lot of this. I mean, I, it was sort of the old guard that kind of uh, and I should say, David has a new thing called postalley.org. Or I, I really just heard about this the yes. other day. Yes, and yeah. so he's got, and and so, you know, it it keeps going the 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 Brewster the Brewster legacy. But I, I think, as as was mentioned before, I mean, the, the, there's still no real sustainable business model, mm -hmm. and the only sustainable business model now we have is with Crosscut, is that you can, you know, it, you can give your your nonprofit, you can give your tax deductible contribution to it. Um, and what would be interesting would be to find out more about how the Seattle Times version of this is working because they have partnered with um, uh, the Seattle Foundation, I believe, to, to if you want to contribute just to investigative reporting, you can give your tax-deductible contribution to the Seattle Foundation that then gives it to this unit within the Seattle Times, even though the Seattle Times is a private enterprise. And um, that maybe that's the answer, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was exciting. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a time uh, longer than 10 years ago now where the internet seemed like it was going to democratize all this in a really astounding way, right? Everybody had a platform and everybody had a voice and it was, it was easier than it's ever been in history to publish something. And so the idea was that there were going to be all these little newsrooms popping up everywhere. And there have been some, you know, the, the South Seattle Emerald has been amazing. Uh, there was a, a, a Seattle-ish, was, a, was, a, was an important news source for a few years there until they finally uh, 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 went their own direction because they couldn't monetize. Uh, so I think it's important, oh, and also that, yeah, different communities were going to finally have a voice in a way uh, that they were never going to. And then, I mean, it seems like to me that sort of social media came along and ate, ate uh, news, news media's lunch uh, and uh, did a horrible job of it. And uh, so can we talk a little bit about what, what ownership means? Uh, it seems like unless you can find a, you know, like a billionaire uh, with, a, with, with a hankering to start a newsroom, uh, you're kind of out of options. I mean, Cliff, do you have, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I'd love to tackle that. Um, I mean, it's the name of the game these days. Uh, what we're seeing is the rapid consolidation of the media. In fact, um, this, was one of the, this was one of the things that I was thinking about the most on my way over here and, you know, scribbling down, I was saying scribbling down random thoughts today, thinking, oh, what's a really smart thing I could say about this? <laughs> because it's clear. And we see and we see it around us, whether it's Sinclair gobbling up um, local TV stations, which, you know, we again, I'm not going to name names, but we all know which station, whether it's um, publishing, gobbling up um, all of these uh, local uh, weekly papers. Right. Um, or on the national level where we have major film studios, uh, major uh, corporations gobbling up other major competitors. Right. Um, and this and this is the interesting thing. That when we see, and I really want to bring this in because this is a point that needs to be discussed. And I actually come from a family of journalists. In fact, my mother met my father when they were both um, writing for, I believe it's the Syracuse Courier. And uh, one of the interesting things uh, growing up was I'll, I always had this consciousness about how white the news media was. And even to this day, despite, um, in you know, I want to give a shout out to this, both the South Seattle Emerald and the International Examiner, not just because I've written for them quite a bit, but also because they've both uh, taken uh, or made great strides in really empowering, bringing on, providing opportunities to young journalists of color, right? self-included. That being said, um, when you see this trend towards media consolidation, that you that journalists of color tend to be those who are most adversely affected. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. And that's what we're seeing, that we see a narrowing of opportunities in terms of 
hire in terms of hiring in terms of um, the ability for and this actually goes back to um, and this goes uh, back to the lack of support for uh, local news outlets and the lack the inability for certain uh, media outlets to be able to monetize because the market's so saturated that essentially you have uh, f you have fewer fewer spaces for um, really journalists of color and even um, media outlets from underrepresented communities to grow these days. And that is a real challenge due to ownership. And how we break that up? Honestly, uh, besides uh, revising antitrust legislation, especially for modern uh, media outlets, that's one thing. But also, um, Peter, you uh, touched on this a bit. Uh, really, uh, some smaller local online publications embracing uh, em embracing the membership model. And actually, this is where all of you come in. And this is where really uh, local journalism becomes less of a, or consuming local journalism and consuming grassroots journalism becomes less of a spectator sport and act of political resistance, supporting that. Supporting that with your dollars, supporting that with your reposts, supporting that in terms of uh, really encouraging um, encouraging these uh, encouraging these more rebellious and uh, you know dare I say uh, reverent and um, really critical sources to grow, especially from underrepresented communities, and especially when, quite frankly, they're just saying real things, you know. Yeah, and and th this question isn't necessarily to you, but it sort of builds on that. In that, uh, what do you do when the when the when the media outlet is dedicated to covering communities that don't have resources? Like, for instance, we have Real Change News, which uh, you know you you support by buying from uh, from street vendors. Uh, Real Change has has shrunk a lot in the last you know uh, 10, 15 years, um, and you know Seattle's homeless community has grown, but but they're not going to be able to, uh, to, to, you know, they don't have enough money so that a newsroom is going to pay attention to those. That they don't have the resources, right? Um, they certainly have a voice, but there's no avenue for them to, to get that voice into mainstream media outside of, of real change. Uh, so what do you do when, when you know, uh, when, when it's not a middle class problem or even, uh, or, or there's, there's, no no money involved at all like how do you how do you account for that in a space where the the media environment is shrinking <laughs> I, I, was, I just i just rather not be hegemonic tonight i mean i could you know but right on nice one teamwork makes the dream work so um in term so there are several things and there are several points of responsibility and the reason i use the term uh responsibility a lot is because it's not easy and there is really we get out we get from it what we put in right so um just remember that for you know these several uh different actors in keeping news that uh really tells the story of underrepresented communities alive, right? So first of all, when it comes to reporting and when it comes to reporters, that honestly, we have to be responsible. We have to, and when I say, sorry, when I say responsible, I should actually say we have to be uh, critically responsible. And what I mean is that we have to uh, keep the, so there was this ethos when I was writing for the South Seattle Emerald that you should go where the silence is, yes? Uh, if you're out there, Marcus, thank you for that line, right? Um, That's so you sh yeah, so you should go where the silence is. And really, for me, when I was writing, I saw my duty as going to those who are most affected and those whose perspective may make uh, white middle class America uncomfortable or tell us something about ourselves that we might not know or reiterate something that we know, but really goes unaddressed in uh, mainstream policy uh, debates, right? And to some of you, maybe I'm speaking to acquire, and to some of you, it you know, might fly in the face of you know, what you would think in terms of reporting, because there's this idea of objectivity. 
the media is not objective. Um, objectivity, I, I find to be kind of farcical sometimes because when we just look at, and this goes back to ownership, when we look at the structure of ownership and we look at who's behind the plot. And by the way, when I say there's no such thing as objectivity, I don't mean that there's no such thing as reporters who are reporting on the facts, and as you should, you know, the who and where, when, why, and, you know, it's not like we make this stuff up, right? It happens in real life. But at the same time that there is a person that there are politics behind whether it's a keyboard whether it's a camera whether it's uh, the printing press there are politics there so for us as journalists that um, especially for uh, publications that cover underrepresented populations like real change or the emerald or the international examiner and so on and so forth right that we have to take that responsibility seriously and that may sometimes just require uh, going to who is usually not considered newsworthy or trustworthy, right? And then the other thing, this is where all of you come in, and there's uh, two, two sides of this. One, there is that uh, you know kind of consumer responsibility. If you're not a member or if you don't subscribe to a local publication, I would highly suggest you do because there is a very objective need for that, uh, for that sustaining uh, capital for these local publications. But two, and this for some of you might uh, catch you a bit off guard, I would engage with the news outlets that you consider to be right-wing propaganda or you consider to be unreputable and actively and actively push back against a number of these misconceptions. And, you know, I I would suspect that you're we're going to be talking about the echo chamber. But, you know, when I talk to my students, I say, when I got back to America after uh, studying, getting my master's in England, I would watch Fox News for an hour a day. I would watch Fox News for an hour a day actively, just so I could reacclimate to myself to American political discourse. Did I find it to be reprehensible? Oh, absolutely. Um, did I find it to be racist? Oh, absolutely. Uh, did I find it to be sexist and revolting and all the things I, that I, you know, I personally find it distasteful? Absolutely. But at the same time, I, you know, a need to be able to engage. So that's uh, another thing. And then last but not least, um, it really goes to, uh, let's say it really goes to those publications having a level of courage because, uh, and I'm sure I know, Adrian and Peter, that you both have stories about publications, particularly smaller publications that focus on, uh, you know, underrepresented communities for days, or myself. But I will say this, that for the publications that are focusing on underrepresented communities, anchor yourselves, stay anchored, and don't be afraid to anchor yourselves despite um, the how challenging it is and how essentially it's easy to you know it may seem like the smart thing to uh, focus more take your focus off those uh, populations but they do need to have courage and to stay rooted in those communities by a creating leadership positions be creating some way of being accountable to those, uh, populations and root in those populations and uh, yeah those are the ideas that's the experience I have comment on that or do you want to ask another question i know you've got a lot of questions uh 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 why don't we why don't we do another question i'll 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 address you uh, i'll address another question to you here uh so the the sort of idea of an impartial objective journalism i think is fairly new i think it it, it didn't really take root for until the past century or so i think the newspapers were always fairly opinionated and uh, and non-objective uh, and so do you think that as as people bubble themselves in on social media uh, and in rural and urban communities uh, do you think that ad advocacy journalism is is a solution to this problem or would it only make problems worse well I would say that we would first have to sort of unpack the notion of advocacy journalism because I think when we hear that, you can think of anything from like fake news, just stuff that's made up to advocate for 
you know, a political cause, whether or not it's true. But advocacy journalism can also be things like, um, you know, reporters uh, reporting on uh, the impact of climate change in local communities and also including possible solutions in their reporting. So, I mean, I think to answer the first part of your question, I think that yes, the notion of objectivity is has not is not inherent to journalism. Um, it's something that's socially constructed, and it's also something that more recently, I think it's much more useful to think about things like truth or transparency or um, you know a rigorous engagement with uh, fact rather than objectivity, because objectivity is a very fraught term, and obviously we're all coming from different perspectives and uh, you know the most famous example of the flaws in objectivity is around climate change communication so uh, you know if you quote a climate denier and a climate scientist um, in every story you give the impression as a journalist that 50 percent of climate journalists I mean of climate scientists uh, believe that it doesn't exist which isn't the case um, so I think journalists, especially around certain issues, like issues of the rise of white supremacy, issues of um, you know, political speech uh, from the highest office, issues of climate change, are actually seeing it as a moral imperative to call out what is true rather than seek two sides of a, the political spectrum of a story. Um, so I do think that advocacy is a really important part of journalism, and it always has been. Um, you know, it's the idea that watchdogging the powers that be is not about advocacy for the public is, you know, it's, that's what it is. It's exactly what it is. So, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. That is conclusive. Yeah, and I would just, I would just echo everything that you uh, said. I think people like myself, <clears throat> in, in a way, uh, as sort of more opinion journalists and, and editorial pages, have messed things up for traditional journalism in the sense that when we think of traditional media, um, you can have a really bad editorial page that's crazy right wing or crazy left wing, and you can have wonderful objective investigative reporting, which is advocacy of its own kind, but more kind of advocacy of here's the issue that's going on in your local community, here's the the uh, abuse that's going on in the port. Um, and so I, I agree with David Goldstein and others who've been saying this, and I did not subscribe to it when, when I was in a position when I could have done something, so hypocrite that I am. I would say that, uh, that if we continue with uh, having editorial pages in traditional media and in papers such as the, everything from the Everett Herald to the Seattle Times and the LA Times, that uh, that people sign their editorials, so you know who on the editorial board said this, and that you know if it's supposed to be the the I used to love writing those things that it was like the voice on high, the the God like you know this is, and um and and it's it's not only outdated, it's um. It's dangerous, or I think it kind of it shields any kind of accountability. That it should go back to the uh, you know William Randolph Hearst days, even of of having Hearst sign his own, you know, uh, and and trying to get various opinions in a way. Because I think for I, I will say this: there, my understanding is that in journalism schools today, they're overflowing. They're getting great applicants. Um, people want to continue to go to places like Columbia and Northwestern and the University of Oregon and, and other great programs. Um, but we're, what, what is, and they are, being, they are adapting to some of the, 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 the new modes and, and recognizing the fact that technology, whether people like me are willing to accept this, we aren't oftentimes, is the fact that at least younger people do not, are not going to want to wake up and get a newspaper to learn all the news that they've just learned online either right the night before or or first thing that morning it's just not dynamic enough and um and that's part of the problem obviously with keeping up with that okay so i'll be brief um and i want to actually build on echo um what both adrian and peter said but we i would love it I would love it if an element of advocacy journalism became mainstream and we w and I could see uh, many of the mainstream pun pundits on major uh, on major news stations stop with the false equiv uh, false equivocation 
when it comes to white nationalism or when it comes to sexism in terms and particularly in terms of treating um, these treating these perspectives as somewhat legitimate because quite frankly they're not and and I say and I say that and I know um, you know for some might be controversial but let's call it as it is um, you know there are a number of times uh, in major outlets where uh, you know where you will have um, the where you'll have objectively racist positions being tried out as oh this is just a narrow perspective uh so you know what does the other you know what does the other side say or oh this is a perspective that exists so therefore let's put it on uh, at the same level as say you know um an anti-racist perspective no i'm sorry that's racism that's belongs in a dustbin of history but unfortunately it's never left right and uh yeah yeah that's i mean that's actually something I wanted to I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, uh, KOW is recording this tonight. Uh, hi, KOW. Uh, of course, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, KOW ran an interview with somebody who was uh, standing in downtown Seattle with a uh, with a, a swastika armband, uh, and they gave him anonymity. Uh, this was a very controversial uh, moment in 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 Seattle history uh, because. Uh, they they did treat him as though he his side, which was basically either the extermination or the uh, outright uh, 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 forced removal of of non-white races from America, uh, they treated him as though that was a legitimate uh, position, and uh, and that was a that was a big moment. And of course, they they did apologize uh, uh, after the fact and. Uh, and they seem to have learned some lessons from that. But uh, something that I learned from that is that the far right, the alt right, is getting very good at working the refs um, and and employing both sidesism uh, to to get to get some outrageous positions uh, on the air. And we've touched on this a little bit. Um, and we've also seen uh, very wealthy people suing uh, publications into oblivion. And that's something that I warn people who come to me and saying, you know, I want to start a, a, news, a, a news site now. I'm like, well, you've, you've got to be prepared for what happens when a very rich person uh, who can hire a fleet of lawyers uh, decides they don't like what you have to say about them, because that is a real problem now. Uh, so when we have these, these uh, this, this is a, a very uneven uh, battlefield now where uh, where one side is super good. It's kind of like watching the Raptors in Jurassic Park figure out how to open the doors. It's like, oh my God, you know, they've, they've figured out the game. Like we can't hide anymore. Uh, how can newsrooms sort of protect themselves from that sort of, that, that sort of manipulation of the system? Can they? Adrian, did you have something? I just, I think it's, this is part of the reason why the conversation about objectivity and the changes in the news media environment need to be addressed both at the level of journalism training in journalism newsrooms, among journalism audiences, um, because if, if these conversations aren't had, then journalists don't actually know what the harm is going to be if they allow somebody from, you know, with a swastika to go quoted anonymously. And I mean, that I, that happened around the Charlottesville. Um, it was a little while after. Yeah, yeah so, yeah. and there was, if you'll remember, there was like a really famous uh, video, a Vice video that was super successful that actually deployed a similar tactic that sort of went up close and personal with these leaders of, you know, these white supremacist leaders, but it, they, it was so clear that they were terrible that the video really worked. And I think that that's what they were trying to do in Seattle with that story. Um, but uh, it didn't work as well because they hadn't thought it through. Um, so, yes. uh, so, on, so on that, I think um, there are a couple of things. So happens so with that um i think the first one of the things that can be done to prevent such things from happening and actually um adrian i really liked uh what you said uh, around having this conversation because once we have the conversation we have to start changing our practices and for me if i was a journalist and i'm at an anti-fascist rally 
I'm sorry. I'm you know I'm gonna fo- I'm gonna focus on the anti-fascists. I'm going to focus on um, you know I'm going to focus on the uh, looking at the uh, looking at the people who are going to be most affected by um, the hate that is being spewed out there because we know what it is. In fact, um, you know, we have a long and tragic history that has taught us what it is. Um, you know, do, you know, I say that we pelt these folks with tomatoes? Well, you know, not, not quite. I don't know. Maybe if it's a Tuesday, maybe. But um, jokes aside, um, when it comes, you know, that would be my first question. It's like, well, why interview that person instead of someone who, uh, you know, someone from the crowd who may have had an experience with, um, you know, may have had the experience with police or someone who is being de- currently being demonized by um, this administration um, and uh, has, having their family stability threatened. And so taking that preventive measure and changing practices in that way, I think, is rather important, right? Um, all, and this actually goes back to the previous question, right? And... I want to, you know, adopt a kind of a long view of this because historically speaking, when it comes to um, people, when it comes to people of color in the media, that we have actually, for a very short amount of time, have had the mainstream mic. That representations of folks of color, folks of color in the media, still to this day, have been beset upon by dog whistles, by stereotypes, things like that, and it was due to. Um, I was saying it was due to parallel sources of, or parallel media sources that were developed in communities of color that were developed in underrepresented communities where we were able to get our message out there and be able to challenge those narratives, right? Um, so, you know, when the media is focusing there, and in fact, actually, um, it reminds, your, now that I think about it, your question reminds me of a New York Times um, article where they... <sighs> What was it? They so. I'll say it was it was almost kind of sweet, down home, nonchalant, where they did this whole um, piece on a neo Nazi, just following around this uh, neo Nazi in um, I think it was. I want to say it was in. Um, yeah, it was in New York City, uh, in or around New York City area, following around this neo Nazi, you know, his whole day to day, trying to show, oh, in, uh, you know. They're uh, just like look, us. In, yeah, exactly. It's like, look inside of his life. And I'm like, excuse me? No, what? No, like this, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't sympathize with a person that wants to see me and my family dead. Yeah. You when know. you sympathize with a Nazi, you're a Nazi sympathizer. Yeah, well, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that, well, that's the thing, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. Yet at the same time, the biggest question, the one of the main questions that always comes up during a Black Lives Matter protest is, oh, is this going to remain peaceful? I'm literally asking you not to shoot me. Yeah. Yes, it, yes, I, I, I think peace is the first thing on my mind, right? <laughs> In in you know in fact that kind those kinds of uh, stereotypes and 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 the uh, what was it that that uh, really lack of critical questioning of that of uh, that dynamic uh, lends itself to uh, many diff- many different things we see in many different things we see in real life particularly the militarization over policing of um, of Black Lives Matter protesters and protests and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, sorry, so that was long. That's okay. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, but if you have questions, feel free to line up on either side of the stage and we'll probably bounce back and forth. So uh, so if you have a question, uh, line up now. Uh, but uh, Peter, I wanted to ask you, as somebody who's been in the industry for a long time, uh, do you what do you think people should know about being media consumers uh is is there something people should know or is it is it not anyone's uh is it is it not the audience's responsibility to be a smarter consumer it is the audience's responsibility to be a smarter consumer there you there you go there's the answer um i do you know i don't want to push back on this notion that there isn't objective uh, uh, that there isn't objective journalism i think we all come with our own our, our own biases and um my feeling is that uh, for smart consumers, th- to recognize that "quote unquote" mainstream 
media is not as evil as as it is portrayed in social media. I think you've had this intersection of a whole series of things, including the the technological changes that we can't do anything about. But you also have, I mean, without mentioning the elephant in the room, but the elephant in the room being uh, the President of the United States, who has harnessed social media in a way that has been more destructive, I'm sure, than anything that's happened in, at least in my lifetime. And, and that kind of hatred uh, and demonization of, of enemies, repeated over and over and over again, has, I believe, uh, made it difficult and, and required people to be more discriminating uh, with media. I, I would hope that, that a smart consumer would do, sounds solipsistic or whatever, that, but do what I do, which is, and what my wife does, uh, which is subscribe and read the Washington Post, the, the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, at least I, we read it on the weekends, um, and then find those special niche places that are of interest to you. So I, I make it the Seattle Times, um, uh, and Crosscut, and the Everett Herald, and, um, and Kaiser, permanent Kaiser Health News. With, again, the caveat with Kaiser Health News and this new model, what's their agenda? You know, technically there's no, you know. But uh, so it's going to be harder, and I, I, it, it breaks my heart. I mean, when we, I think many of us in the room are old enough that in third grade or fourth grade, or fifth grade, we had to cut out those newspaper articles um, and report on the news story. You know, President Nixon is doing blah blah blah, and 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 give your compendium on. on and, and I think that was not only an important writing exercise, but an important civic engagement exercise. My assumption is that that doesn't happen anymore. I, I, I don't know. But um, yeah, that, that, I, no, no great insight there. I do think we're going through it at a really difficult time. And, and I think President Trump, who had a whole summit today uh, where there was a fist fight in, in the Rose Garden between different factions of the crazies, I'm sure there's a more, uh, uh, I'm sure there's a, a better way of putting that, but the crazies, um, and it, it just it, it, it does enormous damage over time and then compounded uh, over time as well. I think. Question? Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question. I'll direct it to uh, Adrian. Um, can a city function without a robust independent media? This sounds like the tagline to this event here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say uh, it depends on what you think functioning is. Um, I would say it functions much, much better if it has a robust uh, media. And it's not just because of the, for the obvious reasons, like we need investigators to keep uh, government officials and corporations in check, but also journalism traditionally ties communities together. Um, and especially Seattle has so many people uh, new to the city. There's so many different groups. Uh, and different communities and different ethnicities that live in the city and, and without a sort of common identity or a common, um, you know, sort of meeting point in terms of information and stories about what's going on, it's very difficult to sort of call ourselves a community. So I would say, no, it cannot function without <laughs> a robust media system. Okay. Hi. Uh, about Julian Assange, he, um, oh, a lot of thoughts going on. I was shocked that were, these so-called journalists said that Julian Assange was not a journalist. He did not perform journalism. That showed me there was a void in the journalistic industry itself. They didn't come out of school understanding what journalism was, what free speech meant, and that was a shock to me. So what do you all think? about what Julian Assange did and related to uh, now that uh, habeas corpus is gone, uh, Barack Obama got rid of that. And now if the government thinks that you're a terrorist, they can snatch you up off the street without due process. And that's going on today. People being arrested for their Facebook postings. And that only affects everything you write, that affects everything Everyone in this room writes when they post something online, and I'm aware of it when I'm posting online. So that affects everything, and that is something you didn't touch on tonight. 
So the, the, the question is, what do you think of Julian Assange and what do you think of the, uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, and habeas corpus, do you agree with Habeas that? corpus. You know, as, as far as hoping one of you guys will get this, no, I'm, I'm just joking with you. Um, you know, I thought I thought it was important. And I, in fact, I remember when um, the war logs uh, came out, I remember when WikiLeaks leaked those and the media store, in fact, it was, uh, you know, a big watershed moment. But one thing I will say is this, and actually I do want to uh, touch on a couple of things that the importance in actually... I don't want to speak to Assange itself, but the importance of um, investigative journalism is is, is especially uh, especially pressing it now because of media consolidation, and you don't have um, that much space for investigative journalism by media outlets. Actually, going to um, your question before, Paul, um, without you don't have that much uh, space for investigative journalism from independent media outlets because of um, the possibility of retribution from, uh, you know, from uh, very wealthy people, from very wealthy people. And, you know, one thing I do want to say, though, uh, about Assange, and, you know, this kind of comes from my own biases, um, honestly, I feel like, I feel like the logs itself and the leak of the logs these days are conflated, are um, the importance of that is conflated with um, whether or not to believe the victims of alleged sexual assaults by him because I personally believe in believing victims. So, you know, that's one thing I want to put out there uh, too. I know it kind of comes from left field, but it's something that in conversations with friends that I think uh, definitely should not be overshadowed I, I can I can make a quick comment on that. I mean, I think Julian Assange is a tricky case, as Cliff pointed out. Um, but I do think that the leaks were important, and I think that they um, gave people a lot of information that we would have otherwise not had, obviously. And I think, more importantly, leak culture today is a really important part of information and journalism that we get. Almost everything we know that goes on in the White House comes from leaks. Um, you know, the press corps is not getting information at press briefings. Um, and, you know, if you take Edward Snowden, for example, it's easier to see the contribution to, um, you know, civic discourse and informing the public that he made because he isn't, his, that case isn't shrouded in questions of his personal ethics or morality. Um, but also, he benefited from the leakers that came before him. Julian Assange's mistakes were, you know, what drove Edward Snowden to leave before he made the, you know, the, before he leaked the documents to make the videos, to come out and say who he was, all these things. And it, the Panama Papers are another even more sophisticated example of all this information that was uh, delivered to, you know, and sorted through by, by news organizations without any person becoming uh, associated with them or being blamed for them. Um, so I don't know if it's, it is an important part of journalism. I don't know that I would call Julian Assange a journalist, but he certainly contributed to journalism, as have all the leakers that we've seen in the past years. You just kind of echoed everything in a very articulate way that I would not have been able to do. Uh, I, and it's a reminder to someone like me who I, I need to I need to separate my personal feelings against Assange and, and the sort of the creepiness factor that I personally uh, that that he evokes uh, and and recognize that there are principles of press freedom that that transcend the creepiness factor. I'm a local photographer, and I pay Google about a thousand dollars a month to run advertising for me. And I think before the internet, that money would have gone to print media. Is there a plan, or are there ideas for recouping some of that advertising revenue that has been lost? I don't have a good answer for that, but I see that that uh, 
we may have uh, the former editor in chief of of uh, the Everett Herald, um, Neil Pattison, who might have a good response because I I do think and who loves photography by the way, um, because you're right. I think it's it, it, it. And how can you be a full time photographer anymore? I mean that's that's the other thing that's so infuriating. Not not only um, with how can you afford to pay a mortgage and raise children as a journalist, how can you um, be a news photographer and photojournalism is so critical. So I wish I had an answer. Really quick. Um, so um, my fiance, who is very talented and wonderful, um, and by the way, if you're watching, love you. Um, so uh, she is an artist and um, Really, she has to adopt a uh, social me um, very multifaceted social media strategy to uh, get herself out there. So it's difficult, um, and it's actually, uh, you know, just to echo uh, what you were saying, Peter. For a lot of people who are uh, photographers, who are freelancers, who are artists, it is it is prohibitively costly to uh, get into that field if you are not in a major media institution. That being said, um, I would, there's not a easy answer, but adopting a larger social media strategy, and I know this might sound a bit silly, but a way to build on your relationships and a way to find, um, essentially to find uh, what uh, the, the different platforms where um, there isn't a, there, where there isn't a, uh, if you will, we're on top of my tongue, uh, where there isn't a major concentration of photographers, or in your case, or artists, things like that. That's a really good strategy as well. So, so do you have anything to say about advertising before you ask your question? Or uh... yeah, I was going to ask in that uh, comment, but I, I start by saying. Um, that uh, <clears throat> the best paid and some of the most talented photographers and videographers in the Seattle area now work for the newsroom at Starbucks. Starbucks has a newsroom and they go around the world documenting how great coffee culture is, how great Italy is, how great Kenya is, how great the farmers are, how great the processing is. That's where the money's going for talented graphic journalism these days. Lots of people want their story out there. They just don't want it told by independent journalists. They want it told by bought and paid for journalists. But that's not what I was here to talk about. But, you know, that's, and they're great photographers. I've worked with them. They were pro photojournalists before they went to Starbucks. But that's where they're working now. And I'm sure Starbucks is not the only one. Maybe Kaiser Health has a photographer. I don't know, Peter. Um, <laughs> The reason I came tonight, um, well, one, the copy desk called and wanted me to tell you that the media isn't dying, the media are dying, J just right. for the copy <laughs> <laughs> But, um, is, it, wait, is Seattle is dying or Seattle are dying? Are we, are we, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, if you run a newspaper, and that's my background, I've managed three, um, you pay people to drive trucks, to run presses, to, to clean the desks at night, and also some people to sell ads, and then a few people left over who actually report the news. If you go into most newspaper models, and this is pretty universal in North America, it's a little different in Europe, 15% um, of the revenue that comes in goes to reporting. 15%. Um, 65% of the revenue comes in from advertising. So here we are laughing at Starbucks, but 65% of the money that has traditionally supported news came from advertisers. And that's what this disruption is all about. It's not about readers fleeing news, it's about advertisers fleeing the platform. And so um, I, I, I know you didn't have exact numbers, but I think we're down about 40% in the state of Washington for working journalists over the last decade, about 40%. And uh, Pew just put out a report that showed cities without um, robust newspapers or without any newspapers pay higher bond ratings because their government's not as responsible. They have more cases of corruption. 
all the way down the line, it costs more. Your taxes will be higher if you live in a city without a newspaper. And I, I wish I could quote the source on that, but I and don't have it with me. there's also more corporate pollution, too, yeah. without a local newspaper. Yeah. Not, just no, not just sources of news, but newspapers. Yeah. So my question is, we talked about having millionaires to write check for, for Crosscut. We've talked about advocacy. We've talked about startups. We've talked about the membership model. It seems to me if we're not going to have 65% of our money coming from advertisers, and we don't need it because we don't, we're not going to have presses and trucks in the future. All we're going to have is journalists, right, and keyboards. Um, we need the readers to be the ones who pay the bill because that's who we, we're supposed to be responsible to, right, the readers? So um, where's that going to go? Can we motivate the public to pay 10 to $20 a month for a source of news. They go, I, I can get it online. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that people tell me I don't need to pay for news, it's everywhere. Um, I can get it anytime I want it for free. What's gonna push people over the edge to the point where they say, we've gotta pay for news? And I don't think it ought to be out of some righteous uh, or sanctimonious, oh, because it's the right thing. They should be paying for news because they like the news, they, they want the news, they need the news, they appreciate the news. Um, not just because it's uh, spinach and they told you to eat your spinach. So I, I really, when I came here, I was hoping we we're gonna hear about what is the fi financial model for newspapers, not newspapers, that's my old talk, news, news organizations going forward. Are they gonna be massive? Are they gonna be a whole lot of small ones? Can they join together? I really would like to know what the latest thinking is on how we pay for news. Because the one thing I've learned, and I'm happy to say I retired three months ago, um, here's what I learned. Peter, I have some disappointing news for you today. Our company is reducing positions and yours is one of them. The person from HR is here to give you a packet. I've done that more times than I care to remember. And that's what's gonna keep happening if we don't find a way to pay reporters. We lay them off. Adrian? <laughs> You've been so good with the, the current responses, I thought maybe you could come up with something. Well, okay, here's a quick one. Why are we asking readers to pay? Why aren't we asking for taxes or some kind of government funds for news which is essential to the functioning of democracy. I mean, this is, I don't know the answer to this, and I don't know how we could ever possibly swing this, but it is interesting to me that in the US model, it's just never considered, it's so rarely considered, it's just always supposed to be on the shoulders of readers, but actually we've seen that democracy isn't really gonna function much longer unless we strengthen news organizations of some sort. So that's my succinct not answer question. I mean, to me, part of the problem is that newspapers uh, sometimes have to tell stories that readers don't want to hear, right? Or that, or, or you know, one of the one of the big changes at The Stranger when when a lot of the staff left was when they got Chartbeat, which is an analytics software that shows it shows exactly where readers' eyes are on the story, and you find out how many readers don't finish the story and how many readers, you know, uh, how many readers are on it at any given time, and you can actually like track their eyeballs down the page and. Um, and, and it changed the course of coverage, and it changed the direction, and it changed, so it was giving people what they want um, based on what they were reading, but that doesn't seem like exactly like a newspaper's job, right? That's, so, yeah, I mean, I mean the question has to do with, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I've heard of tax models. Are there places that, that, that do it very well? I mean, aside from, I guess, BBC and... Yeah, I mean, like all of the Nordic countries, a lot of European countries, I mean, it's seen as a public utility or public good and it's funded. I mean, it's, I, I think it's sort of uh, written into the culture of the U.S. that there's just some kind of hideousness to the notion that the government would fund uh, information, but at the same time, corporations have so distorted and shaped and you know influenced our information landscape that I think that's becoming more and more apparent that maybe it's time to consider this other possibility. Mm. And it, I, would, I assume NPR is probably the closest analog that we have because of the corporation for, for uh, 
public broadcasting, mm -hmm. but it's still not um, it's still not adequate. And um, yeah, I wish. I, I mean, it seems to me I mean, because people have been brainstorming this for so long and still haven't come up with a sustainable. It's always been around the corner. Yeah, <laughs> um, a, a sustainable financial model. The only thing I can think of is if there was an agreement sector wide of we we charge you know unless you're a subscriber you cannot even have one free visit i mean we all do the free visits to different you know um but i i, I it's such Not a competitive it, yeah it's just it's just a, it's just a competitive um it, it's just such a competitive market and um yeah i mean i, I the nonprofit model the, i i don't have an answer yeah. so one thing I want to um, one thing I want to bring up is because I've actually thought about this um, quite a bit, uh, especially when I remember we very on very early on um, when I was uh, just running Buffalo into media, I was talking with uh, some of the other activists, and I said, "Okay, well, you know, should we start charging people?" And one and one of the things that uh, occurred to me uh, very early on is people would really like to support something that speaks to uh, something that needs to be said. In fact, if you look online these days uh, to a number of the uh, YouTubers, number of the blogs and um, different, and different online outlets, that those outlets that are, um, that are more adversarial, that have an advocacy streak to them, that they are able to build up a membership. And mind you, you know, this, of course, is not going to be a surefire solution because I actually absolutely support the idea of um, having some public funding. I mean, hell, if we're going to, um, you know, uh, subsidize petrol and, you know, uh, give subsidies to oil companies, I think that giving uh, subsidies, uh, creating a fund in order to support very broadly a free press, a press that doesn't have to just supplicate to advertisers is a good idea. But also um, building that firm advocacy component into it is a way to start bringing people back, right? And it doesn't have to necessarily go one way or the other, but again, something where we are speaking truth to power. Okay. Uh, we've got two more people up, and that will be it for the evening. You want to go? Yeah. In larger markets, in larger media, is the problem of profitability, or the, is the problem not that they can't produce hedge fund profitability? And related to that, given the danger of, to democracy, why do left or left-leaning billionaires not fund media the way that right-wing billionaires do, particularly in a place like Seattle, which has four, five, ten rather rich people, including your boss. My boss, Nick Hanauer, yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, since you're putting me on the spot, I can say that Nick doesn't want to run a, run a media empire, uh, and uh, that's never been one of his uh, goals. And honestly, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of... Uh, he has a podcast. Well, he does have a podcast, yes. But that's not a media empire. A podcast is different. Uh, it's called Pitchfork Economics, and it's available uh, anywhere you get your podcasts. And I'm on it sometimes. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, I'm not sure I want a bunch of billionaires to, to run the news. I don't... I. I, I read the Washington Post and I love it, but I get a little itchy, you know? And it's like, I, I, and I don't think that it's necessarily, uh, I don't mean to, to hoard the conversation here, I'm sorry. But um, uh, uh, it's not, it's, what I'm worried about is not something as direct as like, you know, Jeff Bezos walking down to somebody's desk and saying, you're killing that story. It's, you know, when you work somewhere, you are aware of who's writing the checks, you know? Um, that was one of the big responses when uh, Como put out Seattle is Dying. They said, well, we weren't told to do this. And it's like, well, you weren't told to do this, but you understand that you're owned by Sinclair, and Sinclair has a conservative lean to it. So you're, it, 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 it always influences you. The person writing the checks always influences you. And you're maybe not going to pursue a story quite as hard if you know that it's going to cost your boss $100 million. 
So it just, I, that just, I, I, the angel, angel investors seem to be a, a, a difficult uh, and, and not really satisfying answer. And I'm sorry, I hoarded the time. Uh, does anybody have any, anything to say to his, his response? Yes. Cool. Awesome. awesome. Um, so I want to push back just a little bit, Paul, because with uh, the ethos, what you're saying, the values and what you're saying, I absolutely agree with. Because, and this actually speaks to something I said earlier, that the people behind the people, you know, on the typewriter and so, so forth, the people writing the checks, definitely influence coverage. On the other hand, we do see a hack gap when it comes to, you know, when it comes to uh, the, when it comes to the media. I mean, Roger Ailes helped found Fox, uh, Fox News, that we have, um, conser uh, we have conservatives, uh, what was it, we have conservatives um, incre increasingly investing in gobbling up media sources. So yeah, we, and I don't want to necessarily say we have, to, well, I am going to say it, but we do need some support. We do need some support from whether it's left-wing billionaires or uh, different, hell, if a community foundation wants to found a left-wing or left-leaning uh, grassroots uh, blog or uh, media site or media center. Yes, we absolutely need that because right now that's, per because there, it's not even a slightly asymmetrical playing field that, for the uh, left side of the media and even the center, that they are in a valley, while on the right side, that uh, that they, or a better way to put this, on the right, it's basically tipped the scales in their favor absolutely and completely. Whereas with the center and the left, it, they're, we're essentially trying to have, we're essentially trying to articulate different perspectives within a terrain that is thoroughly dominated by right-leaning rhetoric and propaganda, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, yeah, um, we do need wealthy left-leaning people to step up and help to fund uh, progressive media. Real talk. Why won't you guys whine more <laughs> about money? And I'm serious about this. Um, I, I love journalism, but not like, it's not my favorite thing in the world. I appreciate it, I'm willing to pay a little bit for it. It's not my life, but it's reporters' lives and it's important stuff. 25 years ago, we'd spend $170 on a little classified ad in the Times, Seattle Times, to sell a house. I'm not sure I'd pay $170 you know, a week to buy the Seattle Times to keep journalists afloat. But part of it is because you guys, not you four, don't whine enough about the evisceration of the advertising dollar, Craigslist, Google, what it's done to the financing model. You kind of are like, support us because we need support, which is absolutely valid and true, but it's kind of like a 60s non-feminist saying, I don't need feminism. It seems like the journalistic community completely ignores the fact that the funding has gone away and won't identify what the funding was and won't ask for ways to replace that. Because I agree, we don't need angel billionaires because then you just work for them. It's like working for Hearst, right? What's the difference? You want to be independent journalists. You want the public to fund it. We need an intermediate financing source. We need to remember where the financing came from and we need to figure out how to replace that financing because I don't think it's going to work with us just doing $15, $65 for internet a month, $15 for HBO, $15 for Netflix, $15 for the New York or Seattle Times or whatever. At some point, we're going to stop paying $15 a month and we still need to fund journalists. And I think that journalists need to whine a lot more about where the funding used to be, how it's disappeared, and how it's going to be replaced. Excellent question. Peter, why don't you whine more? I do whine, but I, I whine privately in, in a Nordic kind of um, reticent way. Uh, I, I, I think that's right on. I think that the problem is, from a message standpoint, it's kind of like when, when a business is, is beginning to kind of um, circle the drain, so to speak. Uh, it, 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 people do not want to invest in something that they feel is failing. And I think, I think journalists are cognizant of not wanting to say, oh, we, we're, we're, we're not being able to, we're not, 
paying our people well enough. This is a civic uh, imperative. Uh, please, please show us your money because I, I, I worry about kind of the, the, the beg I don't know, not the begging model, but, but begging model might be kind of a corollary of the whining model. But um, <laughs> I, what do any of us do if, if like your niece or nephew or child or grandchild says, I want to be a journalist, um, and, and you do like this, I mean, there's still, and Neil knows this better than anyone, there are still these young people who were editors of their paper at, in college who are so bright and so capable and do understand the when, what, where, why. I mean, it's, it's that next generation that I, that I, I, I fear and, and, and worry about. So I don't, I, I don't have a good answer to any of that, do I? Anyway. Adrian, do you have an answer? Yeah, I mean, I would just add maybe whining isn't the answer, but maybe covering the story and all of its nuances, like it, the huge business and political and community story that it is would help as well. So, you know, most journalism outlets have done a pretty weak job of covering uh, issues related to Facebook and election fraud and tampering and issues of uh, venture capitalist companies owning newspapers and then laying off half the staff. All of these things should be a central beat of media that's concerned with public life, but it's, uh, but it's, journalists tend to be timid for obvious reasons about covering, you know, the business practices behind their owners um, until it's too late. Um, so maybe a little bit more hard-hitting investigative journalism around the media landscape might help a little bit. All right, uh, we are uh, running right up against our hard stop time, uh, so uh, I hope you will come up and talk afterwards. Uh, we will be having uh, another one of these panels, I believe, in September uh, to talk about talk more about the media because there were any number of things that I could have uh, directed the conversation towards and just spent the whole night on one issue. Uh, so I want to thank the panel. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you all so much for coming out, and thank you for Town Hall, and uh, have a great night. Thank you.